Before I get started, I know the Super Bowl was last week, but who's excited for the real biggest day in sports today? <laughs> excited for the Daytona 500 in a couple hours, but really excited to continue in our Unfiltered Jesus series, but um, really pick up and, and spend another week reflecting on the cross of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to talk about this, when Jesus tells us to hate your family. So last week we talked about how these past two weeks, these two weeks, last week and this week, are part of a two-week sort of mini-series within our greater series that is the Unfiltered Jesus. These two weeks are and have been focused on the cross of Jesus Christ. Last week we focused on Jesus telling us to pick up our cross and follow him. We reminded that we can't have Jesus without a cross. Both we can't be his followers because of his, without his cross and we can't be his followers without picking up our own cross, whatever that looks like in our individual lives and following Jesus wherever he is calling us to go. Today we're going to look right where Wilmer just read, Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. And we're going to unpack another harsh, blunt, and downright hard teaching of Jesus where he says that we need to hate our father and mother, that we need to hate our wife or our husband, that we need to hate our own children, our brothers and our sisters. Yes, we even need to hate our very lives to be his disciples. In fact, Jesus says, unless you do these things, if you do not do these things, then you cannot be his disciple. Then for, Jesus, then for good measure, Jesus throws in what we talked about last week. He again says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's blunt, that's harsh, and that's certainly hard. That's certainly a difficult teaching of Jesus. So the question that we need to answer today is what in the world does Jesus mean by it and what does it mean for our lives? What does Jesus mean when he says that we need to hate our own family, even our own very lives, to be his disciples? And the really the overarching question that Jesus is answering for us today is what is the cost of being a disciple, of being a follower of Jesus Christ? Because we all know there are many wonderful advantages, there are many free gifts that Jesus Christ gives to us that come with being a follower and disciple of Christ, but also today reminds us, make no mistake, that there is a cost to following Christ. And contrary to what some may say, the cost is not your best life now, at least your best life now as the world would define it. So with all that in line, let's unpack this further, and let's begin to do so by understanding the stumbling block, the hardest thing, that one word, that four-letter word that makes this passage so difficult. The hardest passage, hardest part of this passage is, of course, that word hate, right? What does Jesus mean by hate? Well, we need to understand that Jesus' definition of hate and the definition of hate really in Jesus' day versus our day is much different than what we know of as hate. So in our day, let's start there. What does hate mean? The verb hate means to feel intense or passionate dislike for something or someone. Hate is a feeling that we have, but it's also lived out in our lives, right? Many of us say we have hate, we hate winners, so we minimize our time outside in response, right? In view of the big game last weekend, many of us may have a certain NFL team that we hate, so we do not cheer for them, and often we will root against them. Again, in view of the big race today, many of us may have a driver that we may border on hating with, so we have intense feelings of disdain and distest for them. We understand what hate is in our day, but what about hate in Jesus' day? Because it is much different than our definition of hate. Hate in Jesus' day is not feelings of disdain or detest, but what it is, it is to clearly choose. It is to clearly prioritize something over another thing. It's to clearly prioritize something over another. To hate, when Jesus speaks about hate, to hate in Jesus' day is not to, to degrade or detest something, but it is to choose something else over something else. The Bible gives us a couple examples of hating in the ancient Near East in the context and the, content, and the, and the time of Jesus elsewhere in Scripture. We can think back to the book of Genesis and back to the account of Jacob and Esau. And that moment in their life where Jacob and his mother, Rebekah, they scheme up a way to steal away Esau's birthright, that birthright that was rightfully Esau's as the firstborn son of Isaac. Esau, because of his hunger, and I will add in, because of his foolishness, he hates his birthright, we're told. Now I ask you, did Esau really hate his birthright in the sense that we hate, think of hate? 
Did he hate the fact that the birthright gave him the, the clear pathway, gave him first rights to the estate of his father? That's what the value was of being the firstborn. It was the blessing. It was the estate of your father. In other words, there was a lot of good that came with that birthright and came with being a firstborn. I mean, did Esau disdain all the good that came with his birthright, all the blessings that came with it? No, of course not. He did not detest all of that. Rather, what Esau did was he chose, he prioritized that bowl of soup. He clearly chose that bowl of soup over his birthright in a moment, and of course then he suffered the consequences of it for the rest of his life. Think about a little bit later into Jacob's life. Jacob then, at running away from his brother Esau, he goes to the house of Laban, and there he falls in love with Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel. And so Jacob agrees to work for seven years for the right to marry Rachel, but Laban then tricks Jacob into marrying his other daughter, his oldest daughter, Leah. Jacob is said to have hated Leah. Now, did he hate Leah in the way that he had a great disdain and a great detest for Leah? No, he had seven children with Leah, so of course he did not detest her too much. But what Jacob clearly did was he chose Rachel over Leah. He prioritized Rachel over Leah. His first, his deep, and his true love was with Leah, or was with Rachel. So when Jesus says that we need to hate our family to be his disciples, it does not mean that the first thing that we need to do when we start to follow Jesus Christ is to call our, our wife, our, our family, our children, and our loved ones and say, hey, Jesus says that I have to hate you. Jesus says that I have to detest you. It does not mean that we should detest our loved ones. It certainly should, does not mean that we should detest our own life. But what it does mean, and here is where things continue to get hard and things are hard to live out in Jesus' teaching here, is what Jesus does mean quite clearly in saying that we need to hate our family, is that we need to prioritize Jesus above everything else, even the ones that we love the most in this life. What Jesus tells us here is that he needs to be priority number one in all facets of our lives, even the good parts of our lives, because all the things that Jesus lists and tells us to hate here, they're all good. There's nothing wrong with our family, with our wife and our children and the ones that we love. But Jesus tells us that our priority needs to be him, his church, and his kingdom. Our priorities need to be Jesus. Because each and every one of us in this moment and in this life, whether we sit here right now as a follower of Christ or not, each and every one of us has priorities. And each and every one of us has a priority number one, right? There's a thing in which we choose above every other thing. There's a thing that's going to get our first allegiance. There's a thing that's never going to be second best in our eyes. It could be our family. It could be our children. It could be our job. It could be our wealth. It could be our health. It could be our power or position. It could be our retirement. It could be any number of things, and it could be any number of even good things. But here's the deal, and here's what Jesus shows us here, is, is that Jesus shows us this number one thing in our life. It should be. It needs to be him. Jesus shows us. He tells us very bluntly and very clearly that it needs to be him. And this needs to be true for every single one of us as his followers and as his disciples. This passage today and the passage last week tells us that Jesus must be first. That Jesus must receive top billing. That Jesus must be ruler, that he must be priority number one in our life, and that our life must then speak. It must show this truth in the way that we live and in the way that we speak. Jesus' teaching here is a command to evaluate our priorities, to evaluate what it is that gets first and top priority, top billing in our lives. It's an invitation to leave all while simultaneously gaining all. And here's what I mean by that. Let's unpack what it means by looking at, looking with, at verses uh, 25 through 35 of Luke chapter 14. Verse 25 begins with Luke telling us this and sort of setting the context and telling us how this teaching began. Luke tells us that large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And so in turning and in traveling with Jesus, Jesus turns to them and he says. Now we actually need to pause here before we actually look at what Jesus says. And this verse 25 tells us an important truth. And I've already mentioned it. But it shows us that this challenge, this teaching, albeit as hard as it is, this challenge and this teaching is for everyone, without exception. It's for everyone who desires to follow Jesus Christ. This setting 
or this resetting of our priorities is for each and every one of us saved by the grace and by faith in Jesus Christ. Remember last week we talked about in that moment how the passage began with Jesus only teaching and only speaking with those 12 original, those 12 core disciples. But then he regathers the masses to say to everyone who will listen, this is the cost. This is what it looks like to follow me. Last week he focused on picking up our cross and follow him. This week it's that same thing, but he adds in this, this sort of bonus teaching of hating or prioritizing him above everything else in our lives, even our, our own family. But in both scenarios, Jesus is showing us that to be his disciple, that to be his followers, this is not, this teaching, this picking up our cross and our prioritizing him above all else, it's not just for the chosen few. In, in Jesus' day, it was not just for those 12 original disciples. It was not just them who needed to prioritize Jesus above everything else. It was not only for the disciples who had to pick up their cross and follow him, but it was for everyone who wanted to follow him. It was for everyone who wanted to be his disciples. It was for every single one that wanted to follow him, and the same is true for us and in our day as well. Picking up our cross, prioritizing Jesus above all else is not just for any radical Christians. It's not just for the diehards over there. It's not just for the ones that work as pastors or as missionaries or work in what we call of as, call, think of as vocational ministry. It's not just those people that need to prioritize Jesus above all else, but it is for each and every one of us. Jesus makes that clear to us. He makes it clear to his original audience and he makes it clear to us, by, to the original audience. He makes it clear to them by turning to the large crowd, by turning to all that were gathered there and saying, this is what it takes. This is what it looks like to be my disciples. And he says to the crowds that were currently traveling with him, as Luke puts it here, and I love the way Luke puts it. He says, this is what it means to go from traveling with me. This is what it takes from just simply traveling with me to actually following and as we think about that, isn't that an interesting image that Luke gives us to begin this section of teaching of Jesus? Because aren't there many times, and aren't there many times, maybe even in our own lives, where we may be traveling with Jesus, but are we really following Jesus? Traveling with Jesus, simply, it looks like, and it sounds something like this in our lives, well, well you know, Jesus, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this retirement thing, but, but then I can do whatever I want. Then that's traveling with Jesus. It's prioritizing what you want over what Jesus wants. Rather, following what Jesus would be, Jesus, I can't wait to retire because then I can have more time to do what you're calling me to do. I can use that season in my life to do what it is that you're calling me to do. Following Jesus is, Jesus, what is it that you want me to pursue in retirement or any other phase of life? Traveling with Jesus is saying, you, you know what, going to church, it's, it's the right thing to do. I like this Jesus fella. I like what he gives me. But at the same time, this is my life. And sometimes, and, and maybe even oftentimes, my life and my wants take precedent over Jesus' likes and his wants. I mean, I had a really long day today, Jesus. I will spend time. I will commune with you, but it will have to be tomorrow because the things that I have to do today come first. Oh, man, it's been a really long weekend. And I have all these family gatherings, these things to prepare for. And so maybe, maybe I'll just skip church today. Or maybe, and this is a very new temptation in the life of the church. It's a very new temptation in the life here at Peckway Church. Or, or maybe I'll just watch it online or I'll review it during their week. Friends, of course, there are times and there are valid reasons for not being here Sunday mornings. But we need to make sure that they are actually valid reasons. That we make sure that we are not missing, that we are not functioning, that we are not missing out on functioning with the body of Christ, with Christ himself, we're not make, missing out those opportunities, that free gift given to us by God because our priorities are out of line and out of whack. We must make sure that it is not because Jesus has taken a back seat in our life to the rest of our life, because we should want him. He deserves to be priority and desire number one. We are following Jesus. We are not just simply traveling with Jesus. Following Jesus is not Jesus as our often forgotten friend. He's not that friend that we only call to in times of trouble. Rather, he is the friend that we call to and that we submit to in all things and in all facets of our lives. 
He is supreme. He is priority number one in all areas of our lives. We must see that. We must declare that. But what I believe is most important for us today is we must live that out. Jesus is not our travel companion, companion in life. He is so much more than that. He is the one that should be driving. He is the one that is at the wheel of our lives, and we should let him drive. And here, Jesus invites us to do that, to do that in a, in a more real and full sense by setting straight our priorities in three areas of life. The first one is we need to have the right priorities in our relationships. Jesus gives us this in verse 26 when he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person, they cannot be my disciple. In this moment, people were coming to Jesus, but they were not coming to Jesus with the right priority, so Jesus is about to help them be set straight. Again, what it means to hate our father or, or family, what it means to hate even our own life and being Christ's disciples is not as we've already spoken about. It's not our call to detest our loved ones. It's not our invitation to hate our family. It's not our invitation to cause us harm or to cause our families harm. It's not our call to even go off and to live in seclusion as some sort of a monk or a nun. Church father, pastor, Martin Luther, who came to faith in Jesus Christ in his early in his life. Yet he struggled for years with really believing and living like he had been forgiven. Living like he had been redeemed. Living like he had been forgiven by faith and by grace alone. He struggled to believe and to live like it is by grace and by faith alone by which we are saved and by which, most importantly in his case, by which he was saved. He couldn't believe or he wouldn't believe that salvation gifted to us by Jesus Christ is truly a free gift that we cannot deserve and we can never earn. And so as an attempt to earn that free gift of forgiveness, Luther joined a monastery. But not only that, in that monastery he would subject himself to harsh physical punishment. He would deprive himself of basic necessities and things like food. He would fast, which fasting is a good and a biblical thing to do, but Luther took a point to a point where Jesus has no want, desire for us to go. He took it to a place where it was gravely affecting his health. On top of that, he would have himself whipped as penance for his sin. Anytime he would stumble in sin, Luther would have himself physically beaten. And because of this, Luther was in rough shape, all because he could not or he would not accept that salvation the salvation and forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ is a completely free gift. And this continued until one day he came to the grips and he was able to see that it is by faith and by grace alone in the Lord Jesus Christ by which he was saved. And at that point, Luther began to cease disdaining himself and hating his own life. Now why do I say all that this morning? Many in this room and many maybe joining us online either have or maybe are currently experiencing this same type of hatred for ourselves and for our lives. Maybe you haven't gone off and joined a monastery, but, but certainly you've done your fair share of beating yourself up over the way your life has gone, just like Luther. And so I say to you today, because passages like this, when viewed incorrectly, they can be twisted in our minds or they can even be twisted by certain teachers to further the belief that, man, we have to earn it. We have to earn our place before God. We have to pick up that cross because that's our way of earning our forgiveness and our love that is freely given to us by God. Or that we won't earn our way into heaven. We can't be Christ's disciples if we don't suffer, if we don't do these things, if we don't earn it before Jesus. But hear me when I say this. This is not at all what Jesus is saying here. You can know that salvation is a free gift that comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And you can know that if you have professed Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, then you know that you have been forgiven. Know that you have been redeemed. Know that you have been made new. Know that from what you do from in the moments prior to this moment and the moments that are to come, it has nothing to do with whether or not God loves you or whether or not God is for you. God's love is freely gifted to you and God is for you because of his great love for us. That's nothing, that has nothing to do with what we have done or what we are yet to do. Know that you can truly, and you should truly know, that you have been forgiven by Jesus Christ, that he has forgiven each and every one of your sins in the past and each and every one 
of your sins to come, no matter how great or how many they may be. But also know this, because of the wonderful glory, because of the wonderful reality of the free gift of salvation that is Jesus Christ, because of the wonderful love of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ, then we should want to set our priorities straight as Jesus is inviting us to do here. This always helps me to understand this process of knowing and following Jesus Christ and living in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But we confess Jesus Christ as Savior one time. That's a one-time profession of our mouth. And at that point, we are forgiven, we are redeemed, and we are made new. But confessing Him as Lord is a profession that we make with our life every single day of our life that follows. Every single day, we choose who we make the Lord of our lives. And I pray for us as Peckway Church and as individuals, we make Jesus the Lord of our lives for every day that follows in the rest of our days. And we make Jesus the Lord of our lives by having the right priorities in our relationships. Listen, what Jesus tells us here in verse 26 is that if, if there is a relationship with someone, even someone so close to us, if there's a relationship with someone in which we hold more dearly than we hold our relationship with him, then our relationships need to be reset. Our relationships then need to be reprioritized. Look, brothers and sisters, we often sing songs in the church. We pray, pray, we pray prayers in the church that say that Jesus is better than anything in this world. Lord, there is nothing better than you. And so make no mistake, that's not just a catchy line that we sing, but it is a reality of Jesus Christ. It is the truth. There is nothing better than Jesus. That's a truth that needs to reign in your life. It needs to be seen in every aspect of your life, including your relationships. So I ask you today, is there a relationship that you hold more closely than you hold on to Jesus Christ? Is there someone that is untouchable, even in comparison to Jesus Christ? Is there someone who gets the first fruits of your life and your energy, while Jesus is left to get whatever is left over? If the answer is yes, what I am saying, and what most importantly, what Jesus is saying, is not that we need to cut that person off or that we can't love that person anymore, although depending on the situation, that could be what's best. But what, what I am saying to each of us, what Jesus is saying to each of us, is that our relationship with Him, our relationship with His church, our relationship with His kingdom, it needs to be priority number one. There's no escape clause from this reality. It's made quite clear by Jesus, and it is true for each and every one of us. We need to have the right priorities in our relationships, and our priority number one in our relationship is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Continuing on in Verses 27 through 32, there Jesus shows us that we need to have the right priorities in our plans, in the plans for our life. Verse 27, Jesus says, Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me, they cannot be my disciple. And then in verse 28, he begins to teach and explain this through two parables. He says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you and they will say, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able to with, to with 10,000 men oppose the one coming against him with 20,000 men? If he's not able, the king will send a delegation while the other king is still a long way off and he will ask for terms of peace. Look, following Jesus is not easy street. It's not all cupcakes and rainbows. And what Jesus reminds us here is that life with Jesus is a life following Jesus. In other words, when we follow Jesus, we are no longer ultimately in control of our lives anymore. Rather, we turn the wheel of our lives over to Jesus Christ, and in the most literal sense, we say, Jesus, take the wheel. Now Jesus drives. Jesus determines everything about our lives. Where we work, where we live, he, he determines how we raise our kids, how we spend our time, how we, how we make our plans, and that we don't make our plans ultimately, but we allow God and his son to set our agendas. We allow Jesus to determine what it is that we do, and we allow Jesus to determine what it is that we don't do. We should probably here pause for a moment and think about this from the perspective of our churches and our church here at Peckway Church. 
For we have the joy of celebrating the fact that God has been very busy within our church in these past 18 months or so. God has done a lot of great things and he will continue to do a lot of good and great things. God has had great plans for us and he will continue to have great plans for us forever. And, and think about this. In, in those plans that have already come to fruition and the plans that, have, that are about to come to fruition, they might not always have been our plans. They might not have been the way that we designed it and the way that we drew it up, right? Sometimes, and I would say oftentimes, God's plans are quite different than our plans. Sometimes God's vision for our lives and for the life of our church might be much different than ours. And sometimes those plans might make us uncomfortable. Sometimes they might be different than what we're, we're used to. Sometimes they might not even feel safe to us. They might seem like a risk, but friends, where God is leading, we must follow. In our individual lives and in the life of Peckway Church, God is good and God is leading us. We must trust him and we must follow him. And as we think about this, I think of a moment in the Chronicles of Narnia where Susan is ready to meet Aslan. And she says to Mr. Beaver, as she's getting ready to do this, she says, is Aslan safe? She asks, is Aslan a safe lion? To which Mr. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. And he is the king, I tell you. Our God isn't always safe. He doesn't always do things that makes us comfortable. In fact, he doesn't always say things that make us comfortable. I mean, sending his son into the world in our flesh to be killed was not exactly safe. But boy, was it good. And boy, does his victory over the grave himself, over death itself, does it not show us that he is the king with a capital K. So I ask you this morning, do your plans and do the things that you live and the way that you live out your life, does your life declare him as such? The final, G, the final challenge that Jesus gives us here in readjusting or adjusting our priorities is to reset our priorities when it comes to our possessions. Verse number 33, Jesus says in the same way, those of you, those of you who do not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciples. Now, is Jesus saying that we need to go out here today and sell our homes and sell our cars and sell all that we have to be his disciples? Is Jesus saying that, that all those possessions in and of themselves are a bad thing? Is Jesus saying that we have to live on, his, on the street with no possessions to be his disciples? No, of course, that is not what Jesus is saying. But what Jesus is saying is that those possessions, number one, they are no longer our priority anymore. Our, accru our accruing of more possessions, that's no longer the priority of our lives anymore. And what else Jesus is saying is that those possessions that we do have and those possessions that are to come, Jesus reminds us here that ultimately those possessions are no longer ours anymore. I mean, when we come to Christ, he gets all of us. We don't just pick and choose what it is that we give to Jesus because he graciously takes all of us. He takes the good, the things that we want to hold on to, but he also takes the things that we want to get rid of. He takes the sin and the evil in our lives. And as the good and gracious God that he is in taking on all these things, he demands our full allegiance. He deserves the control of our lives and every part of our lives, including our possessions. So ultimately, our bank accounts, they may bear our names, but the way that we use them, they should testify to Jesus Christ as our king. Our mortgage may be signed by us, but our homes need to be tools that God can use for his kingdom. And we need to view them as the gracious provision of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. For this church and all of its ministries and all of its resources, is this our church or is this Christ church? Is it us that is building Christ church or is Christ building his church? In both our church and in our individual lives, who is it that is reigning supreme? I heard a lead pastor say that he was not really the lead pastor, but that Jesus was the only real pastor of this church. Friends, I pray that this is true today, and I pray that it is always true of Peckway Church. As we look at our individual lives and as we look at the life of Peckway Church, is Christ in the driver's seat or at best, is he tucked away? in the back seat. 
Jesus allows us, he invites us, he commands us to reevaluate our priorities. And then he closes the passage by saying this. And this is my uh, lay translation of what Jesus says in verses 34 through 35. He says, get or stay salty, my friends. And he does this by saying another sort of confusing things. Verse 34, he says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It can neither be fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. What do we do with salt that's ruined? We throw it out. What does Jesus mean by that? Well, think about it with me. Each and every one of us is familiar with salt. And if salt gets wet or if it gets contaminated in any way, if it's not pure salt anymore, if it loses its saltiness, what good is it then, right? It's, it's no good. Salt that isn't salty, salt that is contaminated, is good for nothing more than to be thrown out. We have nothing to do with it. We have no use for it. So as we think about our following of Jesus Christ, the question that verses 34 through 35, that this idea of salt that loses its saltiness, the question that it begs of our lives, is not only are we following Jesus Christ, but are we following Jesus Christ alone? Or are we contaminated with something else? Do the priorities of our lives say that we have been made pure, that we are trusting, that we are surrendered to Christ and to Christ alone? Or best, do our lives and our priorities, do they say that we are trusting in Jesus, but we're trusting in Jesus plus? Jesus plus whatever it is we also trust and we also seek in this life? Or at worst, are we completely rejecting Jesus Christ and, and putting none of our trust in him. The question that this passage begs is do our life's priorities say that, that our relationship with Jesus Christ is the first thing that we think about in the morning and it's the last thing that we think about in the evening? Is Jesus all that we could ever need? Is Jesus enough and is it the thing that we desire above all else? And so as we begin to close both our time together today and our time together last week, I would like to start to do so by saying that, that this is hard. I mean, make no mistake, I, I read these passages that we've looked at the past two weeks and, and other passages where Jesus says really hard and challenging things like, let the dead go and bury their own dead. Where he says that anyone who puts hand the plow in service for the kingdom of God, yet looks back, is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. I look at those things like you and I say, man, that's not easy, Jesus. That is a difficult thing to do. Make no mistake, I am nowhere perfect in any of these realities of following Jesus Christ that we discussed. Make no mistake that none of us are and none of us will be perfect. But what we must do and what we must have is a desire to follow Christ as purely and as wholly as we can. We must have a desire to, to set our life focused upon these realities. We must do this not just because Christ told us to, but because of the great love that Christ has shown us. We must do this. We should want to do this because it is what Christ has done for us. I mean, think about this. Think about and reflect on this with me. When we think of the cost of discipleship, when we think of carrying our cross, when we think of hating our lives, when we think of prioritizing Jesus above everything else, we think about it from whose perspective, right? We think about it from our perspective. We think about what picking up a cross, what picking up the struggles that come with following Jesus Christ will mean in our lives. We think about what it will mean to follow Jesus so wholeheartedly that he's clearly number one. We then think about and we fear what it might mean for us, what Jesus might call us to do, what Jesus might call us to give up. We like to maintain control. We want to maintain control of our relationships we want to maintain control over our possessions. We want to maintain control over our plans and over our lives. Of course, when we first come to these passages, it's all about me, myself, and I. But what about if we think about it from Jesus' perspective? That's when things begin to change. I mean, remember Jesus. What, remember what Jesus said last week, unless you pick up your cross and follow me in doing so, then you cannot be my disciples. He says that again this week. And, and so in other words, Jesus says when he says that we are following him, 
We are following. We are doing what he has already done for us. What Christ has already done for you. He reminds us. He teaches us. I have already picked up my cross. And I've already perfectly, without blemish, without sin, followed my Father's good and gracious will. Today, Jesus tells us to hate or to set aside everything that we have for the sake of following him. And in doing so, he also reminds us that he has already done the same. The clearest pictures of this, I reference it often, but is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 11. Christ has set aside everything that was already rightfully his as the Son of God, and instead he made himself an obedient and a humble servant. An obedient and a humble servant who was obedient to the point of death itself. Jesus set aside everything that was rightfully his in his pursuit of what? In his pursuit of us. In his mission, the bridge, the separation that sin creates in each and every one of our lives. The this, this separation that sin creates in our lives that separates us from God. And thanks be to God, he has bridged that gap through Calvary's mountain and through his shed blood and through his broken body. But what I want us to think about, reflect upon today and in this week, is do we think that it was easy for Christ to do this? Was it easy for him to leave his heavenly throne to take on our feeble flesh? To take that flesh to be born in Bethlehem's stable? To then in that flesh experience every one of our weaknesses, every one of our struggles, every one of our temptations for the first time? To experience hunger? To experience thirst? To experience loneliness? To experience rejection, anger, and temptation? Was it easy for Jesus to have his cousin John the Baptist's head served on a platter? Was it easy doing life with this ragtag bunch of sinners? Was it easy for him to be attempted for 40 days and for 40 nights by the devil himself? Was it easy for Jesus to spend his time with that ragtag bunch of sinners, teaching them all while they continued to prove over and over again that they just weren't getting it? Was it easy living and knowing with someone so close to him, knowing that that someone so close to him was going to betray him? Was it easy to be in so much agony in the Garden of Gethsemane? Agony over knowing what it is that his father was going to call him to do in a few hours that blood literally poured from his sweat glands. And then certainly, was it easy to be beaten, to be mocked, to be tortured, to have a crown of thorns shoved down upon his head, to be spit on, to be mocked, to be so weak that he could not even carry his own cross? To then to be nailed hand and feet to said cross amongst common criminals, even though he was anything but common and he was anything but a criminal. Was there anything easy about what Jesus Christ has done for us? Was there anything easy about the literal and then the figurative cross that he carried for us? As we start to look to the Easter season, we know that the answer to that is no. There was nothing easy about it. But we also know that because of it, we are able to be called sons and daughters of the living God. We know that because of it, and because of it alone, we are able to be redeemed, we are able to be forgiven, and we are able to be restored to right relationship with our Heavenly Father. Because of it, and because of it alone, we are no longer slaves to sin or to anyone or to anyone else because we are set free by Jesus Christ. We are set free by the cross of Calvary. This is the truth of the cross, and this is the truth of Jesus Christ, to which we can say, thanks be to God. But we can also say, and we could also know, that the path to making this a reality, it was far from easy. It was far from simple. It was far from comfortable for Christ. We can know that this all came about at a great, at a grand cost. In fact, it was the greatest cost that any of us ever will pay, that has ever been paid or ever will be paid. It came, and it could only come, at the cost of the very life of the Son of God himself. 
And so what the past two weeks and what the gospel of Jesus Christ as a whole tell us is that the cost for Christ is the cost for us. Well, this is not something that should scare us. It should not something that be something that calls us fear. Rather, it should be something that calls us, causes us to rejoice. Because, brothers and sisters, we have been called to something so much greater than ourselves. We've been called to something so much greater than our possessions. We've been called to something so much greater than our plans. We've been called to something so much greater than our earthly relationships even. We have been called by the gracious and loving heavenly creator of the universe. We have been called sons and daughters of the living God. And in such, and as such, we've been given a mission. We've been given a purpose. We've been given an identity. We've been given a calling. It's to help people know and follow Jesus Christ. It's to pick up our cross, whatever that looks like in our individual lives. And it will look different in each and every one of our lives. It's to pick up that cross and to follow Christ wherever it is he is leading us. And so this morning and every day that follows, we know that the cross to following Jesus, it is high. But we can also know that the return to following Jesus, it will always, always, always be so much greater than anything we could ever give up. Even if Christ calls us to lay down our very life. This morning, as we think about Sadie's passing, I'm sure there were many struggles in her 96 years. But today, she's tasting the fruit of that struggle. And we can thank God for that. And so I ask us this morning, can we, with Paul, and with thousands and billions, I would say, of saints throughout history declare, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord my Savior, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Jesus is of great worth. Jesus is enough. Jesus is all sufficient. But at the same time, Jesus is not safe. But boy, is Jesus good. And may this, may the cross of Jesus Christ, may the goodness of God, and may Jesus Christ himself, May he always be enough for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we this morning thank you for the life of Jesus Christ. Thank you that the reality that the only way that we were ever going to be forgiven and redeemed, the only way that the serpent's head was going to be crushed, was that for the Son of God himself to take on our flesh, to live in that flesh 100% free from sin, and we thank you that even knowing the harsh realities of what that was going to take for your son, and that Jesus, even knowing the harsh realities of what that was going to take in his own life, that you have made that sacrifice, that once and done, that once and all sufficient sacrifice on Calvary's mountain, Lord. We thank you that each and every one of us in this room, each and every one of us joining us online, either has already surrendered to the reality that they have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, that they have been made new by the broken body of Jesus Christ, that sin no longer has hold of them, Lord. And if somebody joins us here today or gathers online and is not surrendered to that the reality, let them know by the work and conviction of the Holy Spirit that today is the day that they can know that they know that they know that they have been forgiven, that they have been made new, that they can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, today we, we thank you and we praise you for the life of Sadie Starr. We thank you for her example of going before us and serving you even in the hardest moments of life, Lord. And we thank you most of all for the joy of knowing that she is with our Savior, her Savior, Jesus Christ, in this moment, Lord. May we use this time, this timing of our death, to draw us all closer to a relationship with you, to draw us all closer to our Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, show us what it is that you want us to do in our individual lives, what it is that, that we need to do in our following and our pursuit of you. For Peckway Church, show us anything that we need to set aside that's not of you or the things that, that you no longer uh, are calling us to do or the things that you want us to do in this moment. Lord, give us a clear vision. Give us clear sight for what it is that you want us to do. Lord Jesus, we pray and we sum this all up by, making, by asking that you would make us a little bit more like Jesus Christ. 
every day, every moment of our lives from this moment forward. And we pray this in the strong and in the gracious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. At this time, I'll invite you to take up your blue hymnals and turn to hymn number uh, 369. We'll stand and sing, and then the second hymn will be on the screen. We'll sing uh, for that one, In Christ Alone. 369, please stand and sing with me and return praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> 